right. Um, I think we'll get started now. See people from N16 are coming through. Mm -hmm. um, so welcome to our second workshop of the quarter. Um, it's about an introduction to Verilog. And we basically took that 10 weeks of M16, packed it all together into this like one and a half to two hour workshop um, as like a little quick cheat sheet. And um, Travis has included a lot of these beautiful digital logic memes that are on point. So hope you guys enjoyed. And digital logic is a fundamental concept in all modern computer um, systems, and it allows your computer to do really complex things with just zeros and ones. And this system that's based off of um, zeros and ones is called binary. And what co computers use binary because they can only read and store an on or off um, electrical charge. And you can think of binary as a new way of representing numbers in a base two format. Um, we use a base 10 or decimal representation um, of numbers. And lots of people think this is because we have 10 fingers. Um, and with base 10, each digit is represented um, in the ones, in the tens, the hundreds um, digit. And it's really easy for humans to understand because we're already used to it. Um, however, computers only understand binary and we're going to get into um, binary representation soon. So before we get into looking at how binary numbers are represented, we're going to look at the base 10 representation um, because we're most familiar with it. And we say base 10 since each digit of the number um, can only take on 10 values from zero to nine. And you will sometimes see a subscript at the bottom of a number to indicate the base. So as you can see at um, the bottom of 182,736, you see that base 10 right there. Um, and each digit value depends on the position in the overall number. So we can calculate um, this digit value by multiplying the digit by 10, which is our base, raised to the power of the digit position. So now we see um, taking, for example, this number 182,736, we start from the rightmost position, um, which is position zero. So we multiply six by 10 to the power of zero to get six. Then we move to the left by one. Um, we multiply three by 10 to the power of one, since that's the um, first um, digit position after zero and we get 30. Then we move on to seven times 10 to the power of two um, and all the way to the left until we reach the leftmost digit. And once we add, um, once we get all of those individual digit values, we can add them up to get our base 10 um, representation. And so if anyone has like any questions or like wants me to like slow down, like feel free to just interrupt. Um, me during the presentation. And so now we want to um, change bases from 10 to two, um, which means we can, or yeah, so sorry. We're gonna change our bases um, from base 10 to base two, which is binary. And this means um, that the digit can only take on two values, either zero or one. And so instead of the ones, tens, hundreds um, place, we now have the ones, twos, um, fours place instead. And converting from base two to base 10 is actually very similar to what we did last time, um, except we placed the 10 with a two. And so let's take this example um, on the right. Say we have the binary number 11001. We multiply the digit one all the way on the right um, by base two raised to the power of the digit position which is in this case zero. Then we move to the left and we multiply zero by two to the power of one. And then we keep continuing this until we reach the last number on the left. Then once again, we take all those individual digit values and add them up. So what we get is one plus zero plus zero plus eight plus 16. 
And this gives us the number 25, which is um, in base 10. So as we can see, we converted the binary number 11001 to 25 in base 10. And so now let's take a look at a, a few examples with binary. Um, we see that 1101 is 13 in decimal. Um, just like we did before, we multiply from the rightmost position um, by two to the power of zero, then zero times two to the power of one, plus one times two to the power of two, um, plus one times two to the power of three to get 13. Um, same thing with their second example for 101101, we get the number 45. Um, how about our third example that we see? Um, there's 10 ones there. Um, can anyone in like the chat just kind of write what this represents in the decimal um, base system? And a hint is that it's equivalent to one followed by 10 zeros um, minus one. It is not 2047, um, but it is 1023. But great guess, Brian. <laughs> and um, why that hint or why that hint is like kind of like important for you to know is because you don't want to calculate one times two to the power zero plus one times two to the power one and like all the way until the end. And a little trick is just to take um, the next largest number of that is one followed by 10 zeros. And then you just subtract it by one to get one, 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 whatever, 10 ones. <laughs> and that will be your answer. And so now we've been um, handling positive numbers um, and representing that in binary. But what about um, negative numbers? We use two's complements, which is just another representation using ones and zeros, um, except the first leftmost bit indicates the sign. Um, we're not gonna get into too much detail about like calculating two's complement number, but just know it's to represent both positive and negative numbers. And we can see like an example um, right here, the first one, it's 1101. We see that the first digit is one, so that's going to show us that we have a negative number. Um, and in the second example, the first digit is zero, so we know that's going to be a positive number. And um, another trick with like two's complement, using the same example as binary, um, we have one, 10 ones. If you see like, all of those successions, this is going to be equal to negative one. So anytime you see like a bunch of ones and like no zeros for two's complement representation, it's always going to be negative one. Okay, so now there are some binary operations that you should probably know. And the most basic ones are adding and subtracting. Um, we can see on the right in like the middle image um, that binary addition is very similar to decimal addition. So zero plus zero is zero. Um, zero plus one is one. One plus zero is one. Um, however, one plus one is actually zero with a carry. And it seems like really non-intuitive at first, like, wow, like one plus one equals zero. Like what, what is this like kind of math? Um, but it's just actually two in binary representation. So as you can see, one plus one equals one zero. And we just carry over the one um, over to carry. We represent that as a carry. Um, similarly for like subtraction, you would do um, the same thing like decimal um, subtraction. However, instead of a carry, you have something called a borrow and zero minus one is one instead. And here, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Travis. 
And here are like a couple of examples using like addition um, with binary. So 1010 plus 0100. If you stack them on top of each other um, and basically add them the same way you do like decimal addition, um, but including the carry as well, you would get the um, answer on the right, 1110. Um, same thing with subtraction. Um, these two operations probably takes like a little more, bit more practice, but this is just like good for you to know in the future. So here's like a little meme <laughs> that I added um, just so you can get a mental break of all these like binary operations and like um, the lingo. But basically it's just saying Zuck is a computer. <laughs> and understands binary. <laughs> okay, so now um, moving on to hexadecimal system. And you're probably wondering right now, like what if computers had 16 fingers and like the amount of power that they hold with those 16 fingers? Um, well, if you weren't thinking of it, you're thinking of it now <laughs> and probably imagining it in your brain. Um, this means we need a base 16 system but we only have um, digits zero to nine. So how can we represent um, 10 to 15? Um, so we can use actually letters of the alphabet to represent the numbers 10 to 15. So as you can see in the little table right there, we have um, in decimal representation zero to 15. And in hexadecimal representation, we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Um, but once we reach 10, we represent it with the letter A, then B, C, D, E, and F. So F is going to represent um, 15. And you will probably see this like hexadecimal rep um, representation um, with like memory addresses or in storage. Um, representation in like CS33 where you have to work a lot with like memory addresses um, and you will have to denote or hexadecimal representation is usually denoted with like a 0x appended to the front. So if you have um, the hex number 1838, you're just going to add 0x to the front. And each hex digit actually represents um, four binary bits. So we can see in the table um, from zero to F, it can be represented in binary with four bits. So what this means is when we see two hex digits, um, this makes a byte. And so there are a few bitwise operations that you'll need to know for implementing digital logic. Um, this includes the AND, OR, NOT, exclusive OR, or XOR, um, and bit shifting operations, which is done on a single bit or between two bits. And this is similar to the Boolean operators you use, you're used to, but it's not exactly the same. So you need to make sure you can differentiate between the two. Um, you see with like the AND and the OR for bitwise, there's only a single character and for Boolean operators, um, you have um, two of the symbols. So for and, Boolean operator and, you would have ampersand, ampersand, and for or, you would have um, the line um, twice. And we're going to use a lot of these bitwise operators um, in Verilog to essentially implement a lot of your logic design. So um, make sure you pay a little bit of attention um, to how these actually work. Okay, so now we're going to look at a few bitwise examples. Um, and the main difference between like the Boolean operation between and the bitwise operation is that bitwise can be done on multiple bits. Um, so we can see on the single bit and one and one equals one, um, one and zero equals zero, zero and zero equals one, and zero and one equals um, zero. 
And that probably doesn't make like any sense right now. Um, and it's probably a lot to like memorize in your head, but the most important thing to remember for like the AND operation is whenever you see a zero as the input, your output is always going to be zero. And if both inputs are one, you're going to have um, the input of, oh, sorry. If both inputs are one, your output is going to be one. I think there's like a small correction I need to make Travis on the zero and zero, um, which should be one um, zero instead. But that was um, my bad. Sorry about that. Um, for the bitwise or, you can think of it as all of the output um, is zero only if all of the inputs are zero. Um, other than otherwise, your output is going to be one, as you can see on um, the slide. One or one is one, one or zero is one, zero or one is one, and zero or zero is zero. Um, and for the single bit exclusive or, um, the output is going to be one if there is an odd number of is going to be zero. Um, for zero exclusive or zero, there's zero um, one inputs, so our output is going to be zero. And we see with zero exclusive or one, um, and that should be zero, one exclusive or zero, my bad as well. Um, that should also be one. So just anytime you see an even amount or an odd amount of trues um, or ones in your input for exclusive or your output will be one. And for our single bit, um, not bitwise operation, um, our input is just going to be inverted. So if you invert zero, that's going to give you an output of one and you invert one, that's going to give you an output of zero. And so we can see on the example on the right, um, going through all of them, we can do the bitwise operations on every single bit. So for one, one, zero, one, and zero, one, zero, one, we're going to get the output um, zero, one, zero, one. For one, zero, zero, one, if we OR that with zero, one, zero, one, um, we're going to get one, one, zero, one. And what this, is basically doing is going from um, the right to the left, doing the bitwise single bit like and or or um, on each position until you reach to the left. And you do the same thing um, for the rest, like you would do the, the multi-bit not operator. So not one zero one zero, we just invert the bits to zero, one, zero, one. Um, same thing with exclusive or, we do one, one, zero, one. Um, exclusive or with um, one, zero, one, one will give us zero, one, zero, zero. And I know it sounds like I'm speaking like <laughs> in binary right now, but um, please bear with me because this is going to be important um, for when you actually use Verilog. Um, and then another thing that we didn't include on here yet is the shifting operator. So as you can see on the um, multiple bits, like little box, we have zero, zero, one, zero, and then two less than um, signs. And then we see the number two. And what this is saying is shifting our number 0010 by two positions to the left. And that gives us um, 1000. And what this shifting operation to the left means, um, each digit that we shift to the left is actually a multiplication of two. So if we shift um, twice to the left, that means we're going to multiply by four. And we see this is correct because we have um, 0, 0, 1, 0, which is two in decimal. And then we shift, and if we binary shift that to the left two times, we get two times four, which is eight. And eight is represented by one, zero, zero, zero. 
and then um oh sorry i'm gonna do like a the two quick questions um so assuming to this compliment this is just kind of like a bonus like question um does anyone know how you would negate a number you can just like add it in the chat area this one's a bit tricky so uh it's totally fine if nobody gets it yes exactly sir. so you invert all of the bits um and then you add one to it to get your two's complement representation to negate a number. And um, what is one way you can bitwise multiply by four? It has to do with the less than signs. All right, perfect, Cameron. So yeah, every time you shift to the left, um, you multiply by two each time. So if you shift twice to the left by two, um, then you're going to multiply by four. Okay, so now um, we can see that learning bitwise operations is not just like, just to throw it out there, <laughs> um, because we see them again in logic gates, which implements these like bitwise operations physically in hardware. Um, so with these logic gates, each input is a binary number. So it's either a zero or a one as an input and the output is either zero or one. Um, these logic gates are made of transistors, which we won't get into too much detail right now, but that's the, basically the backbone of um, all digital logic. Um, hardware chips are also comprised of billions of like transistors that make up um, these like logic gates. And FPGAs are a class of devices um, known as like programmable logic. And it's also called programmable hardware because we can essentially implement these logic gates um, using Verilog and program it. So we can see on the right, we have a bunch of logic gates, but the most important ones you should really know um, for now is the NOT gate, the AND gate, the OR gate, and the exclusive OR. Um, so for the NOT gate, we can see that if our input is zero, we invert it and our output is one. Um, if our input is one, we invert that and our output is zero. And then this is basically like the same thing as the bitwise operation that we just did before. Um, and what the tables on the right side is called a truth table, which essentially displays all of the possible inputs in binary and spit and displays all of the output values for that um, gate. And so we can see like with the AND gate, um, if our input is zero, um, if our A input is zero, our B input is also zero, then our output is also gonna be zero. And the only time that the AND is one is when both inputs are one. And we see with like the NAND gate, um, essentially it's just inverting all of the output of the regular AND gate. So every time you see like an N in front of like a regular gate, so you see NAND, you see NOR, you see exclusive um, NOR, you're essentially inverting the output of the regular um, gate it took it from. All right, so um, we're gonna get into a little, we're going to introduce um, some of the flip-flop um, logic. So a flip-flop or a latch is basically a circuit that has um, two stable states um, in either state one or state zero, and it can be used to store state information. And flip-flops are, are the basic storage element um, in sequential logic, um, which just means there's a clock involved. And as we can see on the right, it's input and sometimes it's negated output is always available for you to use. And so there are several types of flip-flops as we can see on the side, we have like the SR um, set reset type, the D type, the JK type and the toggle type um, that have their own purposes, but you won't need to get too much into um, detail about that. 
Um, it's just really good for you to know since you will definitely have to encounter this um, in M16. Um, Flip-flops also have a clocked input, which just means, which a clock is just a square wave with a certain frequency and your FPGA has a clock and is um, used to determine how fast you can basically run and process um, your data. And logic based on um, timing and clocks is referred to as sequential logic. So every time you see a clock, just think sequential logic. And so you're probably wondering like, why did I do like, why did I look at all this math and like binary outside of school? Um, is it really all worth it? <laughs> um, and it is. So to tie it all together, um, computers, operate using bits and binary um, and logic gates are based off of this like bit operation and these computer functions um, are designed using these logic gates that you'll be able to implement yourself. And so the hierarchy of logic design can thus be thought of like your transistor level to your gate level um, to your modules and then implementing the logic yourself. Um, and what we want to do is to translate all of this logic um, into computer understandable terms um, using Verilog. And logic design, like you already know in like M16 is like 10 weeks. And even then it's not enough time to learn all of the um, digital, digital logic um, fundamentals. But we just wanted to give like a brief overview um, in this workshop. And so um, with logic design, there's a couple um, things you might encounter. The first one it, are adders. Um, so we already went over how to add binary numbers, but how exactly does it work with hardware? Um, well, you can calculate the sum um, using an XOR or exclusive OR gate, and you can calculate the carry bit using an AND gate. And you can see the truth table on the right um, that actually works out the way that we want it to. So we see like your input um, a and B are both zero. We expect that our sum is going to be zero because zero plus zero is zero um, and there's gonna be no carry. Um, for an input of one and the other input of zero, we see that our sum is zero because zero plus one is zero. I'm mean, sorry, zero plus one is one and one plus zero is one. And then again, we don't have a carry until we get um, two inputs that are one. So one plus one is two, but in binary that's one zero. So that means our sum is zero and our carry is one. And now looking at our full adder, um, it's a little bit more complicated than the half adder, but essentially you add in another input called your carry in, um, because if you have a carry out from a previous digit, you, want, you consider that as a carry in that you need to also um, consider when summing things. So we see um, that we basically chain the XOR and the AND into um, the OR gate to calculate our carryout. Um, and we have the truth table on the side, but you won't need to know like too much about like all of the gates um, just yet. And so our next um, logic design example is our multiplexer or MUX for short. So if we have multiple inputs, but we just wanted to choose one of the inputs, we would use um, a multiplexer. So we would need a select input or inputs in our logic, but how many would we need? And basically it depends on how many inputs we're trying to represent. So if we had inputs like the picture on the left, um, we would need one bit to represent two values. So that means we just need one select um, line. As you can see on the bottom, there's a single S. Um, however, if we had four inputs, like we see on the right, I3, I2, I1, and I0, um, we need two bits to represent these four different values. So that's why we have the select line S1 and select line S0. And so now the moment that you've been all waiting for, we will start coding in system Verilog. Um, 
So we can basically simulate um, our Verilog and see the waveforms, um, which represent the inputs and outputs of the modules we'll make. Um, but for now, we just, can you all go onto the website edaplayground.com and if you wanted to save your um, your code, I think you would need to make a profile. Yeah, if you're gonna to need to make an account on this, it doesn't actually let you run it and so you can see the waveforms unless you have an account. So that doesn't take long though. So just make an account on there real quick while we're doing the uh, rest of the presentation until the project. Yes. So hopefully everybody has that website. If so, we can move on. That's correct, it doesn't. All right. Okay, so now moving on to what is Verilog? Um, it's a hardware description language since it describes your circuit that you want to implement um, on the FPGA and it uses your code to build that logic sign. Um, also, there is, you can either simulate your Verilog code or it can actually be physically uploaded to an FPGA and you can see um, your code in action. Um, it's also, the syntax is a little bit trickier than like C, C++, or Python, and there's no stack overflow um, for Verilog, so it might be really fine to, really hard to find help using like Google or like any documentation online. So a lot of times you'll be like really stressed and like pulling your hair out. Yes, Alyssa, I feel that. <laughs> and so before we get started into actually um, coding in Verilog, we need to know um, what a module and a test bench is, which are two main parts that you will need to um, essentially write up. So you can think of modules as like functions in like regular programming languages and your test bench as your main um, function or your driving code. And um, there's one file where you'll need to write all of your modules and then another file, which you will need to write on your test bench, um, which is respectively your left and your right um, files on EDA Playground, which you will see when you click on that link. And so, like I said before, modules are like Python functions. Um, when you want to declare a module or create one, you declare it with the keyword module, as you can see on the first um, box. We have module, the keyword, and then half adder, um, which is our module name. And then we have a odd semicolon at the end of our module declaration. And kind of like Python, um, you don't need to specify the type like an int or like a string or anything. You just type in your um, parameter name. So we have for a half adder, we saw we have two inputs. So we have in one, in two, an output, um, which is our sum, and then our carry out bit. And so each parameter is either an input or an output. And we'll explain on the um, next few slides how to actually declare um, that's an input or output. And then once you've done um, all of the parameter naming, um, declaring your module with the module keyword and your semicolon um, at the end, you want to end your module with the keyword end module. And so nets are basically variables that represent your physical wires in a circuit. And these um, physical wires or nets pass values from one end to the other. Um, so like with modules, they're either your inputs or your outputs and you specify whether they're an input or output with the um, keyword input or output, as you can see on the right. Um, the nets can also be changed um, in blocks called always blocks um, if you specify the reg keyword. So we can see um, the output. Oh, sorry. We can see there's output reg um, out and we can see that out is um, declared as an output and reg will say that um, 
that variable is going to be modified in the always block, which we'll explain um, later on. And normal wires are essentially given values using the assign keyword. All right, so here uh, we have our first example that we talked about before of a logic design, uh, which was our half adder. And so fortunately, our half adder doesn't actually use a clock, uh, which will make it a lot easier for us to transform it into Verilog and means we just have to use assign statements and we're not going to have to worry about using red registers. And so Jackie mentioned before that uh, when we're dealing with uh, these kinds of logic designs that have clocks in them, we call it sequential logic. Uh, but when we're just dealing with logic gates and no clock, we call it combinational logic. So uh, as before, we note our inputs, outputs, and the particular logic gates we use, uh, and then we can begin our design. So we saw before uh, how we actually create a shell for a particular module, uh, and that's what we have on the top right over here. Um, but what we need to do after we've declared our parameters uh, in the declaration of our module is we need to actually say what they are, whether they're inputs uh, or outputs. And we do that right below. And fortunately here, the syntax is relatively easy for us. This is kind of the same as it is uh, in C or C++ when you're declaring a variable. You just give the type, which in our case is input for the first line, then give our variables separated by commas, uh, and then a semicolon to end the line. And we do the same thing with our outputs. We have an out uh, and a carry out, both separated by commas and followed by a semicolon. Now, of course, once we've declared those, we have to implement the actual logic of our function. And since this one is pretty simple, uh, it's easy enough to do that just using the logic gates that we learned about before, or the bitwise operators, you could say. Uh, and so we're going to assign out, which is our regular sum, uh, as the exact or of in one and in two, uh, which follows along with the circuit design you saw earlier and just the logic of what we know it should be. And then we'll assign our carry out um, to in one and in two. So we're only going to be carrying out uh, if both of our inputs uh, are equal to one, which makes sense. So that example was relatively simple. Hopefully you guys found it was. And of course, as always during this, if there's anything that we're going too fast through, please speak up or write in the chat, uh, anything you'd like us to go over again. Um, but we're gonna get into something that's slightly more complicated this time, uh, which is the multiplexer. But rather than doing just a simple two to one multiplexer, uh, we're doing a four to one multiplexer to make it a little more challenging for ourselves. Now, fortunately, once again, we're not dealing with any clocked elements. And as we remember, this is called combinational logics, combinational logic. So one thing that we would prefer, though, is instead of having like a separate S1 uh, and S0 select inputs, uh, I'd like to have a single select input instead, because that's just easier to deal with. I don't have to write as many parameters down, don't have to keep track of as many parameters. Uh, and you might be wondering if there's a way we can do that. And there is. We can create multi-bit inputs. And let's see how we do that. So we're going to use bracket notation uh, to declare the size of our wire. And so we can take a look on the right over here. We've declared an input, uh, which has three, three colon zero as its size. Uh, and this means we're going to have four different bits in that input. Uh, input, input bit zero, then one, two, and three. So if that makes sense, if we had uh, something that went from say 15 to zero, then that would be of size 16 uh, and so on. So the order of the, bracket, of the numbers in the bracket might be a little bit confusing at this point, because you might be thinking, why aren't we just going from zero to three? Um, there actually is a reason for that. Um, so we want our most significant bits to be on the side where the larger number is. Like right here, uh, our, third, our third bit, which would be on the left of the number if we're looking at it on the screen, uh, we, want to be, we want actually to be on the left. So if we take a look at our example on the left over here for wire three zero, uh, if that was equal to one zero one zero, um, then if we were to access uh, element zero of it, it would be zero because that's the one all the way on the right. But if we were to switch the order of how it's declared uh, and we access to element zero, then it would be the one all the way on the left. So hopefully that's not too confusing. But it, do it does matter which order uh, we declare the numbers in. So this looks like the perfect thing we can do for making our select input because we want a multi-bit wire. Um, so we're going to use that. And of course we could always uh, use this exact notation. We could have even used it for our, our adder before if we wanted to just have a single input, um, but we didn't. So let's move on. So if we are selecting between four different possible inputs, 
we're going to want our multi-bit uh, select input to be two bits, because that way we have four different combinations of those bits that we can use um, to select uh, each appropriate input. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So we've gone through a similar process as we did with our adder um, to create our module right here. I'm just calling it some module for now. Uh, I've declared all my inputs, uh, a select and an out uh, as parameters. And you'll notice I don't need to give the size of my cell uh, parameter in the actual parameter list. That's done later on. And then I declare my inputs. So we've got uh, N1 through N4 are all just simple one bit inputs. Um, our cell input is going to be bigger. So we declare it on a different line. Uh, and then we've got our output out. So to declare our input as a two-bit uh, two bit, multi-bit input, we're going to use that bracket notation again. Uh, and it's just going to have bits one through zero right here. So that should all make sense now. So you might think that what we should do now is go back and just take a look at the logic gates and then implement it using that method. And this is an entirely appropriate way to do that. Um, we totally could. But I think in this case, it might get a little bit complicated. So let's take advantage of one of the great benefits of Verilog. So we mentioned before that Verilog is a hardware description language, which means that it is really a coding way of representing physical circuits. But the great thing about Verilog is we can also do some abstractions with it, meaning we can do coding like with if statements and stuff. So we don't actually have to think about every single little bit uh, of logic gate design. So let's take a look at how we can make this multiplexer a little easier. So some of you may be familiar with the conditional operator syntax. Um, some of you may, may not, because I don't think Smallberg actually talks about it uh, in CS31 or 32, but it's something that you might come across. And it's pretty simple, it just works like this. So we have a condition statement before our question mark. Um, if this condition statement is true, then we evaluate the statement right after that. Um, if not, then we evaluate the second statement, which is after the colon. So hopefully that makes sense if it doesn't, uh, I'll be happy to get deeper into it. So one of the cool things about binary is that since uh, true and false in encoding languages are simply represented as one and zero, uh, binary can be either can be seen as uh, simply true or false as well. So it turns out by nesting a couple of these conditional statements, uh, we can get exactly the conditionals that we're looking for. Um, and yes, I was actually kind of surprised to learn in a discussion section in CS32 last year from one of the TAs um, that this is a thing in C++ as well. Uh, yes, so by doing this, once again, we get the advantage of circumventing having to write out uh, each of our logical operators directly. So let's take a look at what that would look like. We've got our framework that we made before, um, but we have this long assign out statement right now to give the value that we want. And so let's go through how that works. So we're first going to take a look at our uh, most significant bit in our select uh, in our select line. And if that is a one, then we're going to evaluate the first of these two conditionals. Um, so if, let me get my pointer out. We're going to evaluate the first of these two conditionals, the one right here. Uh, we're going to look at uh, cell zero now. Uh, and if that's a one, then our output is going to be input number four. So input number four would correspond to a select line input of one, one. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, if on the other hand, our select zero was also was a zero, um, then we would go to N3, uh, which would be represented by a binary one zero on our select line. And so I think using that, you can see how we would access all four different combinations uh, of, our, of the select line uh, to each of our inputs. All right. So we've got a question for an Amazon gift card here. Uh, what does our Verilog code represent in the physical world? So we will value quickness, but also thoroughness in your answer. So make sure it's a good one. Um, all right, hardware circuits. I want more specific than that. Come on, let's give a, give a full sentence here. Everybody still has a chance. Went over it a bit earlier. What's our Verilog code representing? All right, perfect, Brian. Yes, it represents a module of logic gates. Uh, and Jonathan, that's also a pretty good answer. But remember, we can also do sequential logic uh, in Verilog. So it's not necessarily combinational. So Brian, I think you won that one. Very nice. So yeah, this is a hardware description language. We're just describing different ways uh, of arranging our gates to make uh, different modules. 
uh, and I don't think we actually mentioned this before, FPGA stands for Field Programmable, Programmable Gate Array, um, because that's what we're doing. All right, so let's get into the concept of test benches, which we mentioned briefly before. And here's another one of our fantastic memes for today, which I uh, thought was quite fun. All right, so this is the less fun part of Verilog um, because you've done all the actual interesting stuff, which is making your particular module and designing it the way you wanted it to be. Um, but what if you had a really big module? Then it'd be kind of tough for you to actually know uh, that it's correct. I mean, I think if you've coded it all before, you'll know that you rarely get it right on your first try. Uh, so we need some way to figure it out because what if you make your module and you feel pretty good about it, so you turn it into your boss and then he uses it in the product, but it doesn't actually work correctly, uh, then you're probably going to get fired. So we want to be able to test it, and that's where our test benches come in. The basic theory behind it is we're going to create a bunch of different combinations of inputs and outputs um, to supply to our module. Uh, and then we'll examine those to see if we get the behavior that we would expect analytically. And that way we can make sure um, that the design we're using uh, isn't flawed anyway. So the first thing to note about test benches is, although we've described it a lot differently, a test bench is really just a module too, and we declare it that same way as well. And notice we use the, the same module um, followed by end module syntax on the right over here. Uh, and as before, we give our semicolon afterwards, which I've always thought is kind of weird. So one thing about our test bench though, is that it won't have any inputs. And this is because we don't really have anywhere for the inputs to the test bench to come from, because we're gonna be making those uh, within the body of the bench itself. But on the other hand, we will have outputs. So we need to have one of those in our parameter list uh, for our test bench. And there can be more than one of those. I'm just having one uh, in this particular instance. So the inputs that we're going to supply to our other modules, we will instantiate uh, within our test bench. Um, and we're going to make these registers. I'll explain why a little bit later. Uh, I think I mentioned before that they have to do with the fact that we'll be changing them in always blocks. And we'll get into what that means in a little bit. So we've declared uh, register one in one, in two, in three, and in four, as well as our output. All right, so let's go uh, into how to instantiate all of these particular variables, uh, because it's important if you're going to have a variable that you actually give it a value. I think you've probably encountered before in C or C++, if you try to use a variable before you give it a value, you're going to run into issues. So we've got to do that. Uh, and we're going to do that both with our, uh, our particular variables later on, uh, but first we're going to do that with the module that we wish to test. So our module before was a four to one multiplexer, um, so we're going to call it mux four to one, uh, and that's, that's how it's shown, that's its function name uh, in the other screen. Uh, so that's its, its type, but we're also going to need to give it a name just so uh, Verilog knows what we're dealing with. So we're going to give it a random name, I just chose UT right here. So then we're going to supply our parameters, um, as you can see, we do on the right, right here. And there's two different ways to do this. Uh, the first pretty, sorry, let me go back real quick. The first really easy way to do this is just by supplying the parameters in the same order that they're listed in the actual module. And that's what we've done up top. But say you had like 20 parameters uh, and it was tough to keep track of the order. You can also do them out of order and you use this notation um, that we see on the bottom right here. We'll just give uh, a dot followed by the name of the parameter. Uh, and then the variable that we're supplying to the parameter and just separate these by commas. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. It looks kind of confusing at first, but it, it's not that bad. Uh, and Eric, in answer to your question, uh, registers are changed within always blocks. And that isn't gonna make much sense right now, but we're gonna get into always blocks soon. Uh, assign statements uh, happen to just regular wires and uh, those do not need to be within always blocks. All right, so let's get into it a little bit. Uh, so we're going to instantiate our variables now because we instantiated our module already. And we do this within an initial begin statement, which sort of counts as an always block, although it technically isn't. Um, so our initial begin statement is something that we're always gonna have in our test bench. Uh, and it runs once, beginning at the very start of runtime. So if we don't do this, as I mentioned before, if we don't instantiate our variables, we're gonna get waveform issues. So for this particular uh, job, I took uh, a relatively random binary number, um, just the number 1001, uh, which is 9, if my binary uh, knowledge doesn't fail me. Uh, and then I chose a select to start at 0, or 00, zero in binary. Um, and so we're going to see what I'm actually going to do with these uh, in a minute. 
So the main strategy behind inputs, as we mentioned a little bit before, is to get different combinations of them, often as many different combinations as we can, um, so that we can look at them analytically and decide uh, if our test, if our module is doing the correct thing. So I'm going to want to, in this particular case, run through multiple values of select and then see what I'm getting at the output um, to make sure that our, my module is working correctly. But I'm going to have to actually change select during runtime if this is going to happen, and we don't know how to do that yet. But fortunately, Verilog gives us a good and simple way to do so, and that is the always blocks, harking back to Eric's question. So always blocks are always active during the duration of your program. Um, they will start at runtime as well, uh, just like your initial begin statements, uh, and they will run alongside your initial begin, but they will just keep on running uh, and running until they finish with when your program finishes, of course. So within them, you can change registers. Um, don't try to use assigned statements within always blocks, um, but you can change your registers just using uh, good old fashioned equals sign as assigning like this. So within my always block, say I have a register something, then I can assign it during this to uh, the opposite of something or something inverted. And then the end statement is used to indicate that your, all, that your always block is done. So there's two main kinds uh, of always blocks. There's the always begin statement, uh, which is good for test benches, and that's what we're going to be using today. And then something we're not going to get into as much uh, today is the always at uh, begin. Uh, and this is used more in sequential logic because you often have a clock. And so every time um, the positive edge of a clock signal happens, uh, then you're going to run your always block. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, once again, please feel free to, to stop me. So we're going to work on timing our blocks now. Because if you look back at it, how would our first block exactly work? We had something before, uh, and then we were constantly setting it equal to its opposite. So if we don't have any timing going on, it's just gonna, sort of going to be flickering back and forth, uh, and that's going to cause you some real problems. So we're going to need to use uh, the delay operator. And in Verilog, that simply indicated uh, with this pound sign or hashtag, for those of you of the younger generation, uh, followed by a number of ticks to delay. Uh, now, ticks, I believe, for uh, EDA Playground are just nanoseconds, um, but in other programs, you can assign the value of your ticks to make them uh, longer or shorter as you wish. Uh, so another thing to note about de the delay operator is you don't need a semicolon after it. It'll just always be recognized. So you can see in our uh, finished initial begin statement on the bottom over here, um, we f finish after 40 seconds. Uh, and this keyword is just uh, the finished keyword. It ends your program, and you have to precede it with a dollar sign. All right, so hopefully all this makes sense right now. So actually, if we were to uh, run for 40 ticks, this uh, always begin statement on the top, uh, can anybody tell me how many times something would invert if we have our both these statements running at the same time? Feel free to drop it in the chat. All right, we have answer four. That's correct. Because we have a 40 nanosecond long program or 40 tick long program, and every 10 seconds, something inverts. So hopefully that makes sense. This is the bit main principle for how we're going to be timing things. All right, so first, our first idea is how many values do we want to check? And now, since this is a simple four to one mux, I think we're going to want to check four different values in it. Um, so we can use the exact same structure that we had last time uh, and just change our value four times using this overall 40 ticks program. Um, and in our always begin statement, uh, we change select every 10 ticks. And so how we're going to do that is we're just going to add one to select each time. Um, and you might be somewhat confused about how this works. Uh, but it's actually pretty simple. So we start out with zero, zero. If we add one to it, we have zero, one. Um, add one to that, we have one, zero. And then finally, another one to that, we have one, one. And that's all of our different possible select values. And then after that's done, uh, our program stops. So this is our finished uh, test bench right here. And we wrote our finished module before. So we're ready to test. We've done everything that we need to before the actual waveform part. And let's take a quick look. Um, at both of these first. So one thing that I didn't mention before um, that's necessary, but only specifically for EDA Playground, uh, is you'll notice in our initial begin statement on the left, 
we have these two lines, um, dump file, dump.bcd, and then dump fars. Uh, and this is only necessary for EDA playground. You're not gonna have to worry about it later, so don't look too much into it. It's just for uh, creating our waveforms that needs to see this. But hopefully the rest of this all makes sense. If it doesn't, um, feel free to let me know or else I'm going to move on uh, to our simulation portion. All right. So let's talk about waveforms a little bit. Uh, so when we're simulating our design, how we're going to check things is uh, first just some uh, logic logistic stuff right here. Uh, if you have EDA Playground open, you'll probably notice on the left side of the screen, there's a tools, sorry, a tools and simulators section. And I just chose Icarus Verilog 0 0.9.7. I think the compile options was already there for me. And then uh, select open e EP wave after run, if not. Uh, and this isn't really a, bit, a big deal. It's just sort of an EDA Playground thing once again, um, but we're gonna need to have it this way just so we can see it. So after we've got this uh, all, all configured the way we want it to, we're gonna click run. And so if the run is successful, we're going to pop up uh, with this waves loaded uh, screen right here. And it's going to say use get signals button to add more signals to the waveform view, which is important because as it starts, we don't actually see any waveforms at all. So what we're going to do uh, is we're going to click the get signals button over here and it'll pop up with a window that says get signals to display. Um, rather than clicking either our test bench uh, or our instance of our module, we're just going to say uh, append all. Uh, and once we do that, you'll see this pops up. And so this is exactly what we've been going for the whole time. We're able to look at our different waveforms uh, and see what's what. So if you take a look right here, uh, the four things that are constant the whole way through are our different input values, which is good. We had zero, uh, sorry, we had one zero zero one, if I recall correctly. Uh, and so you can see that in four is high instead of one, in three is low at zero, and two is low at zero, and then in one is also high. So we want to see how out this waveform right here changes with each, with each value of select. So when our select value is zero, uh, we want to select the first digit of our input, and that of course is in one. Uh, and this corresponds to uh, a one in our output as well, which you can see it's doing correctly right here. Now when select changes to one, we want to select input number two, which is a zero. And as you can see, our output waveform drops to zero. Uh, and the same thing happens for our select two as well, because we're looking at input three this time, which is zero, and that's reflected in output. And finally, when we go back to one uh, for input four, that's also reflected uh, in our output right here. And so this is exactly what we would think if we were just looking at this analytically. So if, hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Yeah, if it doesn't, once again, feel free to speak up. All right, so we've given you a taste of Verilog thus far. Um, so there's a whole lot more to Verilog than we can teach you in just uh, this hour and a half to two hours. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about, in general, about a couple of concepts you'll probably encounter later on. So we didn't go much into sequential logic today. Uh, so there's, you're gonna have to deal with clocks a lot later. Um, and also something called blocking and non-blocking assignments. So a blocking assignment sort of works sequentially down the line. So in this instance up here, if we had variable one uh, equals zero, um, that would run before the statement below it, which is variable, variable two uh, equals variable one. So we would end up with variable two equals zero. However, if we, got, if we have this little uh, greater than sign right here, uh, then these are called non-blocking and it runs both of these statements at the exact same time. So I think you can see how we would run into some issues right here uh, if, we had tried, if we tried to assign variable two to variable one's value while variable one is getting its own value assigned. So that's just something interesting. Um, here's a bit about constants in Verilog. So we talked a lot about different bases uh, today, like base two, base 16, and base 10. Um, so Verilog doesn't necessarily know which base you're talking in if you're, just, if you're talking about constants. Um, so to be a little bit more clear with that, there's this format right here. So first you'll declare the number uh, of bits, uh, then give an apostrophe, then a B for binary, and then you'll give your number. And this way Verilog knows that you're talking about binary 1011 rather than 1011 and say decimal. Uh, and the same thing sort of works with hex right here. You've got two hex digits, uh, five and A, and we know you're talking about hex. So that's just something you can think about later on. And 
Another thing is you can use, you can declare multiple modules uh, in one file and then use another module within uh, the bigger one. So I think that's what we can see right here a little bit. All right, so hopefully that all makes sense. Um, and we can move on then to our Kahoot. Uh, Jackie, I think you have that somewhere. Hopefully it still works. And this once again will be for an Amazon gift card. So everybody get hyped. Share my screen. Can you guys see the Kahoot? Yes. So the game pin is 227047. Just need to go on. And after this, as usual, we will be doing a project section. So we're going to actually be going through, uh, working you guys through a uh, Verilog module and test bench of your own. We got so few people joining. Yeah, I think we still need a couple more. So if you would like to join, but haven't uh, put that in the chat, otherwise I think we can start in 15 or so seconds. All right, I think we're good to go. Start right now. First question. So how bad were today's little freebie? All of those were correct, so don't worry if you <laughs> selected one. Right, so what is 11011001 in hexadecimal? Remember, D9. So we got Brian and T and Ivan up top. So if 27 is an octal number, number base eight, what is it in decimal? He remembered how we calculated binary and base 10. Brian's still going strong. And we got Mark and Eric. A multiplexer takes in two numbers and multiplies them. True or false? Is false. So a multiplexer with eight input data inputs um, needs how many select wires? 
then you need to be able to represent eight values. You need three select wires because two to the three, um, two to the third power is eight, and that means you can represent eight values um, using three bits. Still got Brian, Jonathan, and Eric. So FPGA stands for Field Programmable um, Gate Assembly. Functionally <laughs> programmable gate array, functionally programmable gate assembly, or field programmable gate array. It is the last one. Ryan, back on top. So, what's the name for different sections of your Verilog code? Functions, modules, or methods? Ooh, everyone got that. When dealing with combinational logic, you must use a clock. True or false? False. That was when we used our sequential. All right, we got Brian, Jonathan, Eric, Phil. Um, Regs are modified using assigned sequences. True or false? False. Use them in a always blocks. All right, so we got Eric, Brian, and Taylor. What kind of waves are seen when simulating the blue wave? 2020, the red wave, 2016, sinus little wave, or square wave. Little political humor there for you. Yes, we hey. got square waves because we have digital technology. I had a question about the regs and wires. Um, can regs be like modified with um, with a sign, even though like, you know, if you're just gonna use a sign, you might as well just declare a wire. Um, I think it throws an error for you if I recall correctly. Really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, it definitely throws an error if you try to assign just like a regular input inside of an always block without using the, uh, without using a sign statement. So. Right, right, right. Okay. okay. All right, congratulations to Eric with two C's. Eric, Taylor, and Brian. Um, is this Eric King? Can you like say, send me your email in the chat? But let me know it's you. All right. Great. All right, I'm going to share my screen then uh, and make sure you guys have EDA Playground uh, open so you can follow along. All right, can you guys see my screen? All right, awesome. So if you guys don't have EDA Playground open and don't have an account, uh, just let me know and we can slow up a little bit for you. Otherwise, uh, I will assume that we are good to go. Uh, actually, I'm gonna go back to the slides real quick. I think we had one to go over before getting into the project. Uh, Almost there. All right, so we just did our cahoots. And so the project that we're gonna do right now, I'm gonna walk you guys through is going to be making that full adder that we talked about last time. And uh, the full adder is going to be a bit more complicated than the half adder. As you can see, we've got three more gates to deal with uh, and an extra input. So a quick refresher on what the difference between a half adder and a full adder is. Uh, our full adder just adds a carry in input. Um, to it. And so the reason behind you might, why you might want to do this is if rather than creating a single bit adder, if you wanted to create like a four bit adder, then you can chain a bunch of these together. Uh, and so the carry out from one will be the carry in of the next. 
uh, and this is really important uh, for like the, for basic computing. Uh, it's one of the one of the main functions that computers do is add. So this is a big one. Let's go back to our EDA playground. And that is here. All right. So the first thing that we're going to want to do uh, is going we're going to want to code our design. Uh, so what's the code? What's the keyword that I want to use if I'm going to uh, create a design? Feel free to unmute so we can uh, get into this. Um, this is true. We want to say module. So we're going to say module full adder. Uh, and we're going to use our parentheses right here where we're going to put our parameters uh, at some point. Uh, I'm going to end it with a semicolon. You don't want to forget that. Uh, and then to finish it off, we're going to put our end module right here. And you'll notice it'll automatically align for you and should turn purple. So we're going to want uh, in different inputs and outputs to our full adder. Um, so can anybody speak up and say what are the inputs that we're going to want? Well, like A and B and then the carry. Sure, that sounds great. Yes, so we're going to need A, B and carry as our inputs. Uh, and then we're going to need a certain amount of outputs too. So what are we gonna need for those? Once again, anybody can speak up. Sum and carry out. Sure, that'll work. Uh, I got sum right here and then carry out. Great. So we've declared uh, all the parameters that we want to uh, in our particular module. But as of now, uh, EDA Playground has no idea which ones are inputs or which ones are outputs. So that's going to be our next step. Um, so we're going to have to use the input keyword, and that turns purple once again as soon as you use it, uh, to declare which ones are inputs. Uh, and as was so helpfully said before, A, B, uh, and carry uh, are going to be our inputs. And we need to make sure to end that with a semicolon, although I'm sure all of you are used to that from CS31 uh, and 32. And then next, we're going to need to declare uh, our outputs for it, which uh, were sum and carry out. Uh, and note that you could be declaring these all on each on their separate line, um, like input A, then semicolon, then input B, semicolon. Um, but I just find it a lot more convenient to do it like this. So we've declared the framework for our full adder module, which is great. Um, but now we actually need to do the logic behind it. So let's start with the logic behind out. Um, so you guys might want to look back at uh, the slides real quick, uh, if you have them open, uh, and take a look at what the mux looks like. So what is our logic going to be for, for out? Uh, which is for, sorry, for sum, I should say. Uh, our logic for sum is a little bit more complicated uh, than that. So if we take a look back at our, at our logic, uh, we can see that A and B must be XORed. Uh, sorry, some, so it's pretty close. Yes. So we're going to start out with that. Actually, uh, we want A and B to be XOR together, uh, which is going to look like this A XOR B. But there's a little bit more to it than that, um, because we also have our carry in that we're going to have to deal with. And I'm actually going to go back up and, and rename this carry in just so we can differentiate it from carry out a little bit easier. Uh, so yes, we're also going to have to XOR that with carry in. So if you look back uh, at the actual circuit design, hopefully that makes sense. So please feel free to stop me if you're wondering why I'm doing that. So, and since we're not dealing with reg right here, uh, we're just dealing with regular inputs and outputs. Uh, we're using an assign statement like this, uh, but we want to actually assign the sum to this. So assign sum equals such and such. So hopefully that all makes sense so far. Uh, if I'm going too quickly or uh, anything, then please feel free to just ask questions about it. So our uh, assign C out uh, is going to be even a little bit longer than that. Can anybody give a longish expression about what this is going to look like? It might take a minute in the chat, but let's see if you guys can come up uh, with what it's going to look like. 
All right, let me take a look at the chart. Okay, we've got a science, yeah, that looks great. Um, very nicely done. So let's copy that in real quick. So we're going to want to sum our carry out equals um, A and B, perfect. And that's a bit wise and, and we can see that in logic gate. Uh, if we look back at our circuit, then we're going to want an or right here. Um, then we have A uh, X or B once again. Uh, but this time, I think I actually did it slightly differently than you. Um, I did uh, this way, but these should be logically equivalent. Uh, so this is another thing about digital logic that I don't think we mentioned before, uh, is that multiple uh, different expressions for logic can actually mean the same thing. Uh, so I believe Cayenne's should work perfectly fine. Um, the one I had before was the one I've written up here. Um, so that's just what I've chosen to use. But once again, either of those should work exactly, uh, exactly fine. Uh, and so once we've done this, this looks like uh, our entire module right here. We've declared it uh, with all the appropriate ins and outs. Uh, and then we have declared the ins and outs as inputs or outs, and we've done all of our logic. So our next step, of course, uh, is going to be to take a look uh, at the test bench. So what's the word I want to use when I'm creating my test bench? Once again, feel free to speak up. We have a chat. Exactly, because we need to remember that test benches really uh, are nothing more than modules themselves. So we're just going to name it test bench because we're feeling uncreative. Uh, oftentimes in actual software, so you're going to have to name your test bench um, the same name as the file that your project is contained in, uh, but we don't have to worry about that since we're just dealing with EDA Playground right now. So we're calling it test bench. Uh, now, do we need any inputs for our test bench? Either chat or out loud. That's correct. We do not need inputs to our test bench because where would they come from? We need something to supply inputs to it. So unless we want to make a test bench for our test bench, uh, we don't need any inputs. We do, on the other hand, need outs. Um, and we're going to make these outs uh, just the same outputs uh, as we had uh, in our full adder design. Although I might name them slightly differently, we'll see. Uh, because we want an out, we want to keep track of both the output, uh, the sum output and the carry out output from our full adder design. So let me just write it as, sure, I'll, I'll just keep the same. Uh, before. We have sum and carry out. And once again, because this is nothing more than a module, we'll just use that same end module uh, to finish it out. So now we're going to need to declare the inputs that we want to give um, to our adder design. And so what kind of inputs are those going to be? What, what keyword are we going to use? Very nice, Alyssa. Yes, we are going to use regs because we are going to change them in always blocks. Let's get back over here. All right, we have reg and we'll just call it um, I'm going to call them N1, actually N0 and N1, um, because just to make it a little bit different from our full adder. And then we also need a carry in. So let's call it carry in. Let's see. And so there's our registers, but we also need to declare our outputs. Uh, but we don't need to say register for our outputs. Uh, all we need to do is just say output um, some and carry out. All right, so we've done our declaration. Uh, our next step is to instantiate uh, our full adder module. Does anybody remember or have an idea about how we might, might do this? Feel free to put a line in the chat with, uh, with the syntax for this. And if you don't have any idea how to do this, that's totally fine too. I'll get to it in a second, but I'm interested to see uh, what you have to say. Uh, initial begin. So Kyan's got the, the right idea here. Uh, you guys, the Brian and Cameron, that's a good idea too. That's just going to be after we instantiate our module. Um, so the process for instantiating a module um, is we need to give uh, the name of the module, which is basically the type of it. Just like if you were saying a function returned an int or something, you would say int func and then uh, so on. 
So full adder is going to be the type of a module. We're going to give it give it a name. Uh, I'm sure FA will work. Uh, and then it's got parameters to it, and we've got to supply those, right? So we're going to, in this case, we're just going to do the simple thing and put in all of our uh, inputs and stuff in order. So we'll say in zero, um, in one, carry in. Um, then we have sum and carry out. All right, so what this is doing is it's supplying inputs and outputs um, to our module. So the next thing we have to do is what Brian and Cameron were saying is we need to actually give values to our registers uh, that we can begin with. So that is going to involve the initial begin statement. And I'm just, just gonna end this right here. Uh, and a weird thing is uh, you notice we don't need a semicolon right here, although you might think we do because of uh, the test bench format above. Anyway, so what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to give, in give initial values um, to our variables. So a good place to start for this is always going to be zero. It's just pretty easy to keep track of. So we'll say in zero equals um, zero. We'll say in one also equals one. And notice because these are regs, we don't have to use a sign um, as we mentioned before. Even though this isn't technically an always block, it's an, it's an initial block, which is kind of the same thing. Uh, and then we want to give a value to carry in as well equals zero. Uh, we definitely don't want to give values to our outputs in the beginning because the values for outputs will be supplied uh, from these input values. You don't want to mess with anything like that. So uh, since how many different values do we have uh, in our four to one mux that we want to try out? Or sorry, in our, in our full adder that we want to try out? I'll give you guys a second to think about that. How many different combinations of our inputs do we have? Uh, oh, sorry, yes, that's, uh, that's my mistake. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, Cameron, do we have eight? Um, yes, we do technically have eight. I think I did. Yes, we do have eight. So uh, I think in this case, I can just go with 80 for the amount of time that we'll deal with I think, uh, before I did. Actually, I'm going to go with 40 and we'll see how we can actually still deal with 40 uh, to give us the right amount. And then of course, we're going to need our finish statement. So we run up, we finish running after that. So this is our initial begin statement. Uh, we've set up our uh, all of our inputs, and we've set up a time frame that we need to finish our test bench in. So hopefully, all this makes sense so far. Once again, if it doesn't, um, just holler at me. So what's our next step? Just type it in the chat or speak up. What do we need to do next? All right, we have something. Always, yes, that is very true, Dominic. We need to do some always statements uh, so that we can actually change these values. And uh, one thing that we're gonna do here that we haven't done before is we're going to have multiple always statements with different delays in them. So one thing to remember about these always statements is they start at the beginning of your runtime and they all run simultaneously. Um, so it's not like they run sequentially or anything. So we're gonna say always begin, I'll just give my end right here. Uh, now, the first thing we want to modify, let's say uh, is input zero. So actually let's, so let's say in zero um, equals, and we'll just invert it because we're dealing with bits right now. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, now, another thing we're going to want to do, of course, is we're going to want to invert uh, input one. Right, uh, let's see. In one. And then the final thing we're going to want to do uh, is we're going to want to have a third always block to change around our carry in. All right, so this is great. We've got a good framework for what we want to do now, but we've got a problem. Can anybody see what that is? What's the big issue with our code right now? Uh, Eric, that's a good question. If we were just doing what we what I have written right here, there would be no reason to not put them all in the same always block. But that gets back to what the big problem with the code is. And that's right, Cameron, they flip infinity. They just keep on flipping back and forth. We've got no timing going on within our always blocks. It's just gonna vibrate back and forth for the 40 ticks until we finish our program. So what we need to do is set individual delays for each of these uh, each of these blocks that will get us the range of combinations that we need. Uh, and now, as Cameron mentioned, uh, there's going to be eight uh, different combinations to try out. 
and so let's make sure that in zero we'll flip eight times. So let's say we give it five, which is 40 divided by eight. So every five ticks uh, in zero is going to flip back and forth uh, between its previous state uh, and the current state. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, now, if we want, how many times do you think during this time we're going to want uh, in one to flip back and forth? And this is, this is a bit tricky. So I'll be super happy if anybody gets this. Uh, four times, yes, exactly. We're gonna want it to flip back and forth four times. So that would correspond to 10 uh, as our delay ticks right here. Um, great. So then lastly, how many times are we going to want our carry in to flip back and forth if we want all the combinations uh, of these three things? Let's see, we've got answers two exactly. And so of course, 40 divided by two is going to be 20 right here. All right, so hopefully this makes sense to you guys uh, why, why this is the case. Um, it's sort of like if we consider our both of our inputs and our carry in um, just to be a three digit binary number. Um, uh, yes, real quick to answer that question. Yes, and delay uh, only affects the individual always block that it's in. All of these statements start, all these always blocks start at runtime and they run simultaneously next to each other uh, during the duration of our program. And for, so for the 40 ticks until we finish. Um, so what we're doing right here is we're trying out every single different combination uh, of these three bits. So hopefully that makes sense why that is. So our next step then is going to be, uh, we're going to want to make sure this works and how we do that is by trying to run it. So I'm just gonna go over uh, to the left over here. I'm gonna click the open EP wave after, uh, after run. If not, I'll pick uh, get Icarus Verilog 9.7 is what I had before. Uh, I think that's all that we have to do over on the left. So then where's our run option? Uh, okay, we've got run up on the top over here. Interesting. Okay, there we go. We've got a syntax error in line 14. So this is gonna be a big part for you uh, of doing Verilog, which is uh, syntax errors, because it's very difficult to get things exactly right uh, the first time through. Ah, yes, I forgot a semicolon after my finish right here, because of course, uh, our timing statements like for, uh, hashtag 40 don't need a semicolon after them, uh, but other ones do. And I think we've also got an error on line 18. That ah, shouldn't be as big of a deal. Let's try to run it again. Ah, okay, so here's the error that I ran into when I was uh, first trying to figure out how to do this whole thing. Uh, and that's because I didn't use that uh, dump file and dump bar statement that we need to use um, in this particular, uh, this particular IDE. So I'm gonna put those at the beginning of my initial begin statement. Uh, let me check the chat real quick. I think we had some good questions there. Uh, so yes, Eric, they do not have to be assigned, assigned in any order. I could have done the carry in uh, inverting first. I, I just chose to do it this way because it seemed most logical to me. And I think that's how I did it before. All right, so now hopefully you guys have been able to add that dump file statement in here. Uh, just copy it exactly as I have it. Uh, and then we'll try to run again. All right, great, so we're making progress. Uh, and now we've got all of our signals that we want. Okay, there might actually be a couple extra ones that we need, but let's take a look at them real quick. I think you can ignore, uh, we're looking at the top five uh, right here. Uh, so we're going to analyze uh, right now what our output is uh, our output and sum R for each combination of N0, N1, and carry N. Uh, so for instance, if our N0 uh, is one and everything else is zero, then we're going to want our sum to be one. So hopefully you can see that. I don't know if there's a way I can, I uh, don't think there's a way I can get a laser pointer going, uh, but hopefully you can see that we can trace along right here uh, when our carry N uh, is zero, our n1 is zero, and our n0 is one, then our sum is going to flip to one. So if we're looking at the top five right here, 
That makes sense. So if we go to the next tick, uh, you'll notice that in one is now one, uh, in zero is zero, uh, carry in is still zero. Uh, and we've got our sum is equal to one, which should be good as well. Uh, all right, let's see right here. Then we've got our in zero and in one, uh, our ones, our sum is zero and our carry out uh, is one, which is what we're looking for as well. And so we just analyze all these different waveforms, making sure that it's what we're looking for. Oh, I think that carry out right here is a little bit off. So, so is this all working for you guys? Uh, are you able to get to this point as well? Or are you just looking at what I'm doing? So uh, could you guys type in the chat if you're able to get to the point that I was at? All right, great. Okay, so actually um, this found a error, a quick error in my logic that I uh, hadn't seen before. And it's exactly why we're, oh no, Dominic. Um, but. And this is exactly why we do uh, this waveform analysis. So we noticed that a couple points, let me just run this again to show you guys. Uh, at a couple points, my carry out was one when it shouldn't have been. So let's take another look at this. Um, so you'll see right here, uh, carry out is one. Um, and it shouldn't be one because we have uh, our only one of our inputs is a one and the other one is zero. So it doesn't make sense for our carry out to be one as well. So that indicates that we've got a problem somewhere in our code. And that's because I accidentally made a typo um, at our carry out uh, on the, in the full adder. And that's uh, by putting a exclusive or uh, rather than an and uh, between A and B right here, or the opposites. Sorry, A and Sorry, that's what it should be. So make to change accordingly. That was just a typo on my part. And so now let's run it again uh, and see how it works. All right, great. This works exactly like we wanted it to. Now we can see that carry out um, is a zero until both of our other inputs, one in one in zero and in one are ones, and then carry out goes to goes to a one. So this is ex exactly what we're looking for. All right, so that is uh, our project for today. Hopefully you guys were able to get that uh, and get the idea of how we create our modules, the principles behind creating our test benches, uh, and then how to look at these crazy looking waveforms to see what's going on. And so you'll notice we were just looking at the top five of the waveforms that were given right here, um, which were the ones from our test bench, which is what we wanna look at. Um, the bottom five ones are uh, what's, generated, uh, what's generated from our test bench and given to the, uh, to the adder. So I think that's about it. If you guys have any more questions about Verilog or anything we just did, uh, feel free to ask. Hopefully that's helped some of you out who might have been struggling with ideas behind Verilog and M16 uh, or something like that, or who are M in M51 and uh, actually don't get any exposure to Verilog in that class. You are very welcome, Alyssa. We are really glad to see all of you here today. Um, we're gonna post this on YouTube. Uh, eventually when I get to it. I think I usually take a couple days to do that. But, um, it will be there if you guys need to review anything. And of course, also feel free to reach out to us if you want any more, uh, any more tips on it. So I hope you guys enjoyed. I think I'll stop recording. I have a, yeah, I have a 